welcome my viewers and thank you for joining us once again. Today we have with us Pio Danielo. The name sounds so Portuguese or Hispanic. Don't worry, he's a Nigerian studying in Nairobi, Kenya. Pio is a missionary student. He began his studies in Ghana. From Ghana, he went to Burkina Faso, if I'm not mistaken, and then he went to Tanzania. And then from Tanzania, he is currently right now in Kenya, Nairobi, studying as a missionary student. Pio, thank you for joining us. Thank you for making our time to sit with us. Thank you for coming to share with us your wonderful experience today. Thank you, Pio, for coming. Uh, thank you and welcome also. Thank you. So I will go straight to the point. And I say I always, I don't, I never prefer to write down questions. I don't like writing down questions and I don't like preparing beforehand because I always want my guests to feel free to share what they want to, what they have to say. To not, I don't want to, I don't want to limit what, whatever they have, they have to say. I want to feel free, say it out there and so that people could relate to their experiences. And one thing which is very important for me to underline is that this show is aimed at empowering the African youth, but all, as well as the world youth, all the young people all over the world. The show is also a way of creating awareness to certain situations that people go through in life. So, Pio, your experiences, I think, will be very meaningful to our young people out there, both young and old. I believe that they're gonna learn a lot from you, and I really appreciate that you're gonna speak out freely. As I say, no constraint, don't hold yourself back. Say what you want to say, and when people could relate to your experiences, then they could really find meaning in their lives. So I will go straight to, the, to my first question. I came across an article you, you wrote, and the article is titled, My Holy Ground, An Experience of a Sorrowful Joy. When I saw this title, I was like, what is, why, why this title? So I had to glance through it. I read the article, and I was like, wow, this guy, definitely needs to share this thing out there with people. And then we, I got in contact with you and you freely and happily accepted to share that experience. I know what the experience is all about, but I don't think my viewers know what your experience is all about. So that's why I will invite you to please tell them what you experienced during your time in Tanzania as a missionary. Okay, thank you very much, bro. Um, I think from the title of um, the article, My Holy Ground, an experience of sorrowful joy, uh, we say it has to do with um, an event that happened to me two years ago, approximately two years ago, that was um, 2018, on the 11th of June. And that event for me, I feel is the most memorable event in my life. Yep, and it has to do with an accident that I sustained in Tanzania, as the western part of Tanzania, precisely Kigoma. Um, it was a motor bike accident that um, fractured my right tibia and fibula bones. Um, that is to say, my my leg, literally, that is my right leg or the shin part of my right leg, yeah, to put it simple. And then um, from then, that was on the 11th of June, 2018, I had a first aid treatment at a hospital very close by in Kigoma. The doctor said um, they could only put some kind of back slap to support the leg, that is the tibia bone precisely, so it doesn't shake too much. But then I was referred to the best um, hospital, I would say, in Tanzania, Moi Hospital in Moimbili, in Dar es Salaam. Mm -hmm. And it was a matter of emergency. So we had to leave Kigoma the following day. And um, the only way to get to Dar es Salaam as fast as possible was by flight. So that was also another sorrowful point of my life, to fly from the western part of Tanzania, extreme west, 
to the extreme east, Dar es Salaam. It was a two hours flight. So you could imagine I was just literally, I was struggling with the pains. No anesthesia to help or painkillers as such at that time. So we managed. Then from the airport, immediately we had um, an ambulance that came to take me from the plane directly to the hospital straight. Then I had the first major surgery. In all, I had six surgeries in four months. Huh? So the first surgery, that was on the 12th of June, 2018. Um, that surgery was basically to fix the infection markers. It's called um, external fixation surgery. So the methods were placed inside the tibia bone, the two parts that were broken, and then it, it came out to support. So it was more or less like an exoskeletal frame. And then I was with that for about three weeks, after which I had the second surgery, when the doctors, they confirmed that the infection markers were treated. So I had another surgery, and this time around was um, internal fixation. I so place the metal rod, it, um, it's called intramedullary rod. They had to place it inside the tibia bone to support both part of the leg. Yeah, so um, I had that. It was successful from the beginning. And then after about four weeks, um, just as the doctors, they, they rightfully said, after about four weeks, I started walking slowly, slowly um, with one crutch and then later freely even I could manage to walk freely without crutches but I was having the metals inside my tibia bone. Now unfortunately um, there was an injury just on my shin around where the bone was fractured and the injury came due to the the fact that um, a bone fragment was removed from that part of the leg so the injury refused to heal, it got infected, and the infection got into the leg. But then the doctors in Dar es Salaam, they were a bit um, reluctant in telling me the truth. Huh? So they were giving me some kind of hope. But then one day I said, I mean, you just be sincere with me, what's going on? If there's nothing else you you can do because i mean from time to time i find it even at that point difficult to sleep because of the pains and everything so i had to the doctor said okay fine i think we are failed here if you have the means we recommend you just go to india so that was another point in my life where wow i became scared yeah, that was the truth. I became scared. I, I am hardly um, the kind of person that fear, but I must confess at that point in time, I became scared because I realized already from my injury, I started reading about um, bones, everything, orthopedics, and the rest, the possibilities of me um, getting to work again. And then also contacting some of my friends who are in the medical field, some doctors, some nurses. And so I was afraid because at that point, I, I realized that the bone was infected. So um, with the help of the missionaries of Africa, especially the conferences there in um, Tanzania, I was able to book a flight immediately. That was on the 8th of September to India for another surgery possibly to also fix the leg in general yeah and then um i arrived in india on the 11 because i passed through oman so i arrived on the 11 of no i arrived on the 10th of september and then um immediately i went to the hospital because i arrived in the morning i couldn't even rest so with the anxiety and the rest so I, I proposed to the conference there, I mean, I, I think I've come for treatment, so I, I better go straight to the hospital. So I went straight, and then the doctor said, okay, fine, we, we, we are going to have an x-ray to check. 
I came with some of my medical files already from Tanzania so they could read through my medical history. And then um, I, I had a quick check there in India. Then from there, myself, I was shown the images and everything. Then I could see that um, my tibia bones were melting out. Huh? Wow. It was already infected, wow. yeah. And it was wow. just the the rod that was holding both sides of the leg together. So I became really scared. So the doctor said, hey, Pio, the best thing for us to do now is to take off those metals in your leg because they're infected. And then we put um, an antibiotic rod in it. So you don't place your leg on the ground for four weeks. So the antibiotic rod can treat all the infection before we could start any other treatment on that leg. And he said, I'm going to decide. You don't have a choice if you want to walk. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So this guy said, okay, so that you mean good. I'm going to walk again, right? He said, yeah, you are going to walk again. But with time, you might even be able to run and even play football. But the truth and the fact remains that you won't be the same again. So that was also a kind of um, shock for me. But I accepted and I said, well, I don't have a choice. You are, you are the expert here, so you just help me out. So I was booked for the surgery and that was what happened. We had the first surgery to treat the infection. And then after four weeks, as he said, that was now on the 11th of October, the metal, the antibiotic rod was removed from the tibia bone. And then I went in for the main surgery now. And this was external fixation this time around again. But this time um, I had 17 metals passing through my tibia bones. Wow. The fibula bones was not infected. In fact, the fibula bones, they had already, it was already healed. But then the doctor said, um, in order for the tibia bones to get, um, will I say, to reunite again, we have to break that fibula bone. <laughs> so if not, the, the tibia won't won't get to heal itself so i had no choice they broke it again and then <laughs> they started the treatment yeah 17 meters passing through the the leg and then um he said i will stay with that for um four months so i was anticipating my release in january um but it never in it never happened like that when I went back there, January, um, that was on the 30th of January, the doctor checked. He said, fine, the tibia bones are reunited, um, but I'm still afraid because if I take the metals out and you, you slip by mistake, it might break again. So I'm giving you extra five weeks so it can be strong enough. Mm -hmm. So I had no choice. I went back disappointed because I was already anxious that, oh, now they will take this off and then perhaps I can start moving again as usual. Yeah. But when it happened, I had to wait again for extra five weeks. And after the fifth week, I went back. Then he, he started mentioning the same thing. And then I said, um, I said, but is there something else that can be done apart from me going to wait again with these metals? He said, I'm fine. It is okay. We can take it out. But I wouldn't like to leave you freely like that. So I'm going to put a kind of um, basque. It's uh, more or less like a special one. Mm -hmm to support you for the meantime while the injuries um, gets healed. So I accepted and that was what happened. After which I returned back to Tanzania. I started working slowly, slowly with a crutch. And then um, later on as time went on, I think um, I finally dropped the crutch in Nigeria. 
because I I went back to Nigeria to see my family and then to have some kind of rest and holidays. That was around April last year. And then um, I actually decided to drop the crutch after seeing my mom. <laughs> yeah, I think just the, the same day I met my mom, mm. I came to the house with one crutch, but that same day I met her. So, I mean, I decided yeah. to... Yeah. Yeah, that happened. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, and I also decided to drop it, but it was more or less a kind of um, a sort of full meeting. Yeah. Okay. So that is my story in a nutshell. Uh, perhaps wow. if you ask more questions, then I can oh, definitely, I have a lot to ask. Yeah. I have a lot to ask. Yeah. First of all, I would like to say thank you very much for freely sharing with us your ordeal, what you experienced. You know, when you said that you had to travel by flight without an aesthetic from Eastern Tanzania to Western Tanzania with the pain. I was like thinking about St. In, St. Ignatius of Loyola. After, before, before his conversion in the military, he had problems with his legs. There was no sense they had to treat him like that and he felt the pain. So I was like thinking about you that I was like, <laughs> I know how painful that can be. I haven't experienced it before and I hope not to experience it. Experience it. But yeah. really, my brother, I know <laughs> that what you went through that. wasn't really easy. And as I say, I thank God for that you're able to walk again. I thank God that you're able to sit with us right now and you're able to share with us freely. But my question comes right now. Looking, at, looking back at these difficulties, what would you say mm. kept you going? What would you say was like, that light during this that during the dark times in your life, what was that light? What what did you hold on to? What kept motivated you? What kept you going? Yeah, first of all, I would say um, the constant support from those around me, um, especially the confreres, all the confreres I met around that point kept me going okay first of all um when i had the accident uh, perhaps you know bertrand i'm sure you know yeah. bertrand i think so yeah i do i do yeah, yeah. Bertrand, i know him yeah yep so he was the first person i called when i had the accident imagine i was looking at my leg broken and then um that was the first time i went into a shock in my life i've never understood what it means to be in a shock we always um, read about that in different psychological courses. We speak about being in shock and so, but I never understood until that moment. And mine was more or less a kind of freeze. Yeah, I freeze. I couldn't run. I couldn't cry. I couldn't shout. So, yeah, it was really something. But then something came to my mind that I should call Bertrand. So I called Bertrand immediately. And then when Bertrand came, before he came, I pulled off my cardigan and tried to hold Come both part of the, the leg so it doesn't dance so wow. much. So when Bertrand came, then he saw the leg broken himself. He was a bit, um, he was really disturbed. I could see from his facial appearance. But then he said something that I will never forget. Huh? He said, don't worry, bro. They will fix you. Wow. So that statement, I'm telling yeah. you, I've never seen someone with a broken leg like that because it was clear that the leg was completely broken, huh? both bones. Yeah. It's not around the joints where you say um, maybe it's a kind of, um, uh, how will I put it, maybe it is twisted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, yeah, it was clear that it was broken, yeah. yeah. So but from his statement, I I got some kind of courage. Yeah, I said, if he said they will fix me, perhaps he has seen something like that before. So uh, that was um, one of my motivation. And then um, as time went on, yep, I, I, I wouldn't deny, uh, I always had that hope in God. Uh, I always believed um, uh, that um, God won't leave me like that. <laughs> of course, you have to, you have to. Sure. You know, I had that, 
that that's assurance where, in me. Yeah, that's where yeah, our faith is coming to play. Yeah. Yes, and then I I felt like well perhaps it's trying to teach me something in a different way. So <laughs> that was now the biggest yeah. motivation. Yeah. yeah so yeah, I decided yeah. to calm down and then just follow the experience each yeah. day as it comes and decide to take it it as um as possible and one thing i remember throughout my adventure in different hospitals and then with different people one thing that people hardly understood was the fact that um it was clear i was suffering i was suffering it was very visible and very obvious but they, they couldn't understand that the guy is still joking and laughing yeah, and then you, ask, you see someone asking you, is it really paining you? So, uh, you? You are seeing 17 meters passing through my bones and coming out. Yeah, you see the way I'm walking with things. And yeah. Sure, it's paining me, but I can't wow. do anything about it. I have to endure. Wow. And um, I have the constant encouragement from my family members also kept me going, especially yeah. that of my mom and dad. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Wow. I think they they were more or less uh, they were so sure than myself. I would say that I will work again. <laughs> yeah, they were so. I, I would say that they were they had that total conviction. Huh? Myself yeah. sometimes I used to doubt when I see the different um, possibilities and the rest. I was quite ready for the worst, but um, I thank God for everything. So that was my motivation. I, I can say, yeah, you know. Yeah. So I would say, I would say you mentioned like three three things, which are first of all you mentioned God, secondly you mentioned your the support from people, and then thirdly you mentioned your family. I'm just kind of putting it in the order of in like chronological order. Wow, um, I think this is something which is very important for us as human beings, and no matter where we are, where you come from. We gotta we are always realize that we are interconnected. What one, the pain of the other person is my pain. The joy of the other person is also my joy. And I think mm-hmm. that you felt the strength from people that kind of gave you that adrenaline, that push you needed to support yourself, even to be to feel truly convinced that I was gonna get better. I know like you were lucky that I wasn't present. Maybe I might probably be crying. I'll give an example why I said that. I remember two years ago, we went to Bethlehem for a football match. And during the match, one of my colleagues, I think he made a, he, 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 he broke his leg. Like, it was very, you could hear the bones crack. <laughs> excuse, me, excuse me, making the sound. You could hear the bones. They made crack. And I was, he made him saying in French, Ma jambe cassé, ma jambe. my leg is broken. And I was yeah, shocked. I and I immediately, I began crying. I began, I literally began crying because I was like, what is, so like, but you saying that if you could really feel that people were supporting you, for me, I think that is something which some of us, we also have to learn, like during this time, what a person needs need most is not that emotional fear, but rather a sense of courage, strength, that mm-hmm. everything's going to be better. I think this is what you felt from your family, from people around you and from God. So my next question is, after all this, you had to go back to Tanzania, right? Yeah. To, f- to finish your mission there. So yeah. but going back, did you feel like, excuse me, what, what I would say PTSD, a post-traumatic syndrome? Or did you feel like, oh, I'm going back to this place. I broke my leg. I won't be able. I will be more careful. Or did you feel like, okay, I'm going to go there. I'm not going to work. I'm not going to give myself completely to the people. I'm just going to be in my room every day. What did you do? How did you manage the after incident? Um, yeah, I I would say well, going back for me was um, it was a joy that I, I was going back first of all to meet those who gave me initial assistance. Yeah, when the incident happened, I never you see I never took it as um um maybe the fault of the people, the fault of the country or so, um, because of my own kind of, um, will I say, con- 
concept about the world. Eh? Mm -hmm. I simply took it as just a bad luck that could happen and that can happen to anyone. And it has happened to me because I'm also a human being. That was not, my conclusion. Not, yeah. not God punishing you. <laughs> no, I never took it like that. No. Okay. I never took it like um, maybe God is punishing me or yeah. um some some would say maybe your villagers are dealing with you. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. No. I simply took it as um, a kind of bad luck huh? that can happen to anyone, and it has happened to me simply because I'm a human being. So how do I deal with it? First, I have to accept it. So going back for me was um, as normal as possible. I went back and I was happy to be back. And I think the people were happy to see me back. Yeah, because they saw me back in a different state. Actually, many thought I wouldn't come um, come back there because um, they felt and this guy has... um broke his leg and then um he's not telling us something i think he's not coming back yeah he's just gone so that was the conclusion of many and then for them to see me back standing again and then uh walking freely without crutches wow. yeah it was something many couldn't believe it eh? wow. yeah many wow. couldn't believe it and uh, I, I was happy they were able to see because um, if I hadn't gone back, and then possibly perhaps if they were hearing that now I'm working again, and they might not believe 100% as such. So <laughs> yeah, and um, I was happy that I was also able to go back to say goodbye in a proper way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, to say goodbye in a proper way because um, it wasn't, um, I was not happy the way I left. It was very tragic, yeah. yeah. You leave heartbroken yeah. and then you didn't really have time to to even take your things. Huh? Imagine yeah. I, when I had that accident, I never stepped my foot in my room as our community for nine months, yeah. until after nine months, yeah. So wow. all my things, the things I had with me all along from the accident, it was Bertrand who helped me to gather them from my room. So oh, there's the few things I was taking along from place to place. Oh, that's amazing. So, yeah. Well, going back for me was good. Yeah. Oh, well, that's good. That's good. Because sometimes we always want to, run away from you know they say <laughs> yeah once you experience something bad the easiest way is to avoid it always you know so once one run away from something like that but you going back reminds me of some of these great men out there that are risking their lives every day to serve people in the hospitals in the um old people homes if i don't know but like i give for example the health care workers yeah. Most of them are risking their lives every day because this corona thing is real, but yet they don't want to give up. Just like you, you didn't give up, you went back, you put the people first. Like, other person is more important, is it comes first before my life. So, I think for me, this is something which is worth emulating by every person out there the ability to live for the other, live your life for the other person. Be, be compassionate towards the other person that is suffering. I think really, even when your pain, in your sufferings, you didn't give up. You still went back to the people you were called to serve. Really, I would say thank you for that courage and for that grace. Um, I w so I want to ask my next question before I go to the last one. How have that impacted your life today? Because you termed your you 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 termed your article as my holy ground an experience of a sorrowful joy. So I feel that that has a connection because you might, you might have sat today and looked back at it. So how have that impacted your life today? How do you feel today? And how do you think that, what, what, what do you think you've learned from that experience that somebody out there can learn from? And what do you think that, what, do you, what did you feel were like challenging to you? Because you won't tell me everything was like smooth. Mm -hmm. 
professionally, you had some challenges, you had some some doubts, yeah, sure. some regrets. So as I say, you feel free. If there are things you don't want to say, don't say them. If there are things you feel like you want to say to help people relate to your experience, feel free to yeah. say them. Yeah. Um okay. To be sincere with you, huh? my main fear at that time, I would say it was um the fear of not walking again. Yeah, that was my basic fear. Um, I mean, not walking again with my legs complete, but I had plans of if that can't work, mm -hmm. then um, perhaps I, I should be able to fix some kind of artificial leg. But uh, I had plans for myself. Huh? Yeah, I had plans. I mean, if I can't work with my natural legs, then I should work with something. Yeah. So my major fear was for my leg to be amputated. Huh? I was really afraid of that. That is one. But then um, I would say it has, Im it has impacted my life in so many ways. Um, and then it has changed me. And huh? just like my doctor in India told me, I don't know, I'm not the same again. <laughs> <laughs> I would yeah. not. Mentally and physically, I'm no longer the same. Because after the accident, many things happened. And personally, um, I used to be more of a head person than a heart person. Head in the sense yeah. that I I do more of logic more of thinker, than uh, yeah. or more of reason than emotions. Yeah. Huh? Yeah, I used yeah. to do that. Yeah. But then with my with my accident, I think I changed. It was it's now the opposite. Huh? <laughs> so yeah. So I think I, I made a fast journey from my head to my heart. <laughs> and I, I prefer this state yeah. in a way. Um, I tend to be more sensitive now to things around me, people around me. I tend to be more, will I say, compassionate. And then um, I'm more empathetic also and also sympathetic. I do visit hospitals even before my accident but i do that initially without um so much concern i don't really know how um it means to be on a sick bed before my accident but then now i'm now doing that um before the corona pandemic issue all started i i was going to the hospital every sunday yeah I do that every Sunday, and then I have even made some friends from there. I'm sure some of them might be watching me um, at the moment. And um, I think the way my approach now is different. Huh? I can easily relate with their experience. And then I, I can easily speak to them more or less from my heart, because I, I have experienced it. I know what it means to yeah. to be in a theater, um, to to be bedridden for some time, and then um, it helps. Um, one other way I would say it has also influenced um, the way I see things. Huh? And now I totally agree with um, Robert Green when he said. Uh, even though hard works help, uh, but um, hard work helps, but you still need a little bit of luck. Yeah, now I accept <laughs> that point of view. <laughs> you, still need a, uh, you, need, you need a little bit of luck, brother. Really? Lucky. Uh, okay. uh, <laughs> you can be the smartest in the world, but if you are not lucky, it won't work. <laughs> yeah, really? Yeah. Not, yeah. And even the same, I always tell people, even here, where I am, yeah, they had a chat uh, with a friend of mine here, and then uh, he was so courageous. And then he was uh, like, no, it's all about personal effort, hard work, all that, all that. I said, I used to be like you until I broke my leg. <laughs> <laughs> and then he kept quiet. And yeah. later he came to my room, and then yeah. he said, Pio, I think you are right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that, that is yeah. it. You you can't be so sure of life. Huh? Yeah. That is my conclusion. And then um, we should be ready at any point in time that um, 
anything can happen. We are still under God's creation or creative work. So God is creating us every day. I enjoy playing football, but now I can't for the meantime. I'm still hoping and praying now. I should be able to do that maybe sometime next year, according to what my doctor said. So, but yeah, in all, I mean, it was pretty scary at that time. It wasn't a nice experience. It's not something I would love to experience again, but looking back at it, I think um, it's one of the best things that ever happened to me. Yeah, that's why I, I named it my holy ground. Because it's, oh. it's the current situation in which I stand, and um, more or less a, a kind of sorrowful joy. Yeah? So yeah. It, it, you know the the expression in English, yeah. um, oxymoron. Huh? Yeah, it's yeah. Sorrowful, but it gives you a kind of um, inner joy and contentment because at the end of the day, you see that um, it wasn't totally bad as such. Wow. Yeah. Wow, wow, that is what I can say. Really, Pio, you've you, you really made me speechless, really. You know, your last word now, like it wasn't bad. I'm like, wow, this dude is <laughs> this dude must be joking, you know. <laughs> like, really, I actually admire your courage, I truly admire the way you've seen your you kind of you, you you kind of turn that experience into something which is more beautiful that you could learn from. You have to say it takes lots of courage to be able to do that. Really, really, my brother. I really appreciate your honesty. I really appreciate you coming out. I really celebrate you because I say it's not always easy. And there's something you said. I don't think my viewers will realize that. And that's one thing you said. I mean, I'll, I'll mention it. You said, I used to be a head person, but now I'm a heart person. Yeah. Wow. Some people may not understand what that means. Uh, you you explained it a bit here. Someone would think a lot, but now you are more emotive. You try to be compassionate. And even what you learned from that experience were things that led you into service, in the life of service, to give yourself more for the other, to, to the other person, the other person suffering. And I think this is something which is very powerful. And yet you that used to be a head person, wow, making that journey, that transformative experience, and then yet seeing the beauty of the whole situation, really, I say it takes this, that this makes you a man. This, this is what courage means. This is what being a man means. Because we always feel that being a man or being a strong person is when you move your, you know, you move your shoulders like this or when you are lifting heavy weights every day in the gym. You understand me? That's what we think that being yeah, a man, yeah, yeah. you, you carry your, as I say, you, you carry your shoulders so high, you behave like the most powerful person. That, I think for me, being a man is what you really say. I'm strong. Like St. Paul said, but to the weak, I became weak. You know, yeah. you were strong, but when you even at that, you were able to go down, go down, go so low. And then from even when you went down, you came up again and you're able to serve people freely, happily, um, joyfully. Really, thank you, Pio, for this wonderful experience. So I want to ask you, do you mm -hmm. have any do you have any last word you want to say to any young person out there, any old person, somebody, no matter the pain, it's called that, there, might, there, might, there might be people experiencing something different from you, not broken legs, maybe broken hands, maybe yeah. difficulty to find food during the time of corona, maybe difficulties to live together as a family, because you can have broken family, broken homes. There are kids living with abusive parents, there are kids or, or wife being abused by their husband. People are in different abusive situations, different painful situations, different sorrowful situations. So what can you say to those people experiencing all these kind of things in their life as a, as a way for them to look forward to the light that is, that is at the end of the tunnel? Um, yes, I would say, first of all, um, you should have some kind of conviction huh, within you. Mine was God, huh, that um, God is with me in my situation. Huh? See the book of um, Exodus, chapter 3, verses 5. Mm -hmm. huh? When God told Moses, huh? take off your sandal because the place you are standing is your holy ground. <laughs> yeah, that's where I got that tape from, actually. So your experience, no matter how painful it is, you should 
take it as it is. Huh? Accept it. It's a fact. It is happening to you. You don't deny it. Because when you deny it, depression might get in. Yeah, that was what I was really avoiding, huh? depression. So you you try to you accept the situation huh? and you don't take it as anybody's fault, not even yours. It's not your fault. It is nobody's fault. It is not your fault. It's not God that is punishing you. It's just life. Life happens. It has happened to you. So how do you cope with it? You see? So you... You know, devising means of coping with that pain. Mine was what um, you are among the few people that kept me going. And Nelson, with your constant chat, actually, with your constant <laughs> chat on WhatsApp, sometimes we could chat, and then I don't, I didn't, I, I couldn't even um, realize with my pain. I mean, I start laughing, okay. and others also. So um, these are part of the things that can keep you going. And you don't cut yourself totally from people because you can easily get frustrated. So you accept those that are there to console you, wow. those that wow. are willing to be with you. You see, the, the problem with some people, once they're in pain, then they get isolated then you, you can easily be frustrated like that. So you, you don't get yourself isolated and you, you allow those that want to be with you to be with you. And then you also look for what makes you happy. What is your hobby? Yeah, what is your hobby? If your hobby is watching movies and you watch as much as you, you can watch, like that you watch, you are tired, you sleep. You don't have time to think about your pains much. Myself, part of my hobby, you know, is I'm playing um, computer games. Yeah. So then yeah. in India, okay, before going to India, I was playing this um, PES in my yeah. laptop. I mean, I started the whole season of um, PES 2019 Master League. Yeah. I was just playing the whole season. I, I, I think I reached up to 10 seasons. Eh? Imagine <laughs> buying and selling players. And wow. Then in, wow. in India, I had to buy Nintendo Switch. Uh, so yeah. that I could lie on my bed and play in the handheld mode. I still have it here with me. So, <laughs> yeah, it keeps me going. I mean, when you feel um, life is a bit tough, you just, you, you go for what can give you that immediate happiness to keep you going. Huh? Um, another of my hobbies uh, actually once i put it in one of um in a, in a magazine a hobby joking with my elders and then many were laughing but it's actually yeah. my hobby <laughs> i like yeah. joking with my elders so, yeah. and my dad is one of those i like to joke with a lot yeah. and um, from time to time he could call me and then we 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 just joke and it keeps me going so i mean that is what I can say. It might not really work for you the way it works for me, but um, I think all of us, we have our different ways of um, trying to keep up with life. So you you try as much as possible not to be frustrated. You just tell yourself, this is not giving me depression, and then it will work. Yeah. I mean, I had there were a series of events that happened up, uh, after my accident and for me i felt is a uh, more or less psychological a kind of traumatic um experience that or will i say the the event it was just going from you know um i'm trying to remember but i can't really remember now i, I saw that somewhere in a journal psychology or in a psychological journal somewhere it's like if you are not careful a bad event happens to you, a series of bad events will follow, a series of bad luck. Huh? So, man, what happened? After the accident, what happened? I lost, first of all, I lost about $150. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Second day I was going to, um, I came back from India. I lost um, 50 Oman Real. Mm -hmm. Maybe I told you that 50 Oman Real at that time was... Um, about $200 because at that time, one Oman Real was um, $4. So okay. that was about $200. Mm -hmm. 
and it's not as if I didn't have the money much at that time, but I was just I I couldn't understand Why what was happening. Uh, Why was I dropping the money? Was I yeah. or am I thinking and then just misplacing the things or so? Yeah. And, um, I even lost my passport. Imagine. Yeah. And then um. I had to go for a police report there in, in Tanzania that I had lost my passport. What happened? Okay, I had the cover page on the, the biodata page of my passport. And then um, uh, I also went to the Nigerian embassy there in Tanzania. So they, they gave me some kind of certificate mm -hmm. to prove that I really misplaced my passport because I had the the receipt of the resident permit yeah. and the resident permit page photocopied. Yeah. So I used that. Then I went to make the police report. And then what happened? The police guy, okay, seeing that I was a Nigerian, you know, we had we were having a kind of bad international image. And so yeah. it, it was like, um, are you sure you really lost your <laughs> They put in the box immediately. <laughs> then I, I, I told him, I said, I said, man, I'm not a fool. I said, if I not, they lost my passport, or if yeah. what I'm telling you is not true, yeah. I'm not a fool to come here with one yeah. crack to present myself to you to so, arrest me more. Yeah. <laughs> it's always that mistrust, yeah. I yeah. broke myself here. Yeah. So yeah. people around the they started laughing. Mm -hmm. So he also laughed and then they stamped and then I moved on. Now at the airport, I was on my way back to Nigeria. What happened? The immigration guy, you know, I already had um, a stamp from the immigration office. So the immigration guy also was like, uh, what really happened? Why did you miss your passport? I mean, he was just making me to stand unnecessarily. So I told him, I said, man, if you don't trust what I'm doing, if you feel I am here illegally. Deport me back to my country. I'm already back. I'm already on my way back. So you can deport me. It doesn't make any difference. <laughs> so his colleague laughed. He also laughed. He said, I can go. That's why I went like that. So I mean, it was, um, you, you should be able to cope with these things. Eh? Yeah. You don't allow me to pull you down. Oh. No matter what happens, you just keep moving. And um, be happy that others are thinking of you. That is the main thing. If you don't feel others are thinking of you, you can easily be frustrated. And I, yeah. I really appreciate most of the confreres uh, of the missionaries. I mean, some I never met them, but I, yeah. I had a lot of good messages, people checking yeah. on me, and it really gave me hope. Yeah. So that is what I can say. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So I'll just read some comments here. I say Rich, Richard Mulenga, he's from Zambia, and he says that this is a touching experience. And then we have Peter Ekur, who is currently in Congo, if I'm not mistaken. He says, yeah, Pio, it has been a transformative experience. I imagine your fears, pains, and disappointments, but I really appreciate your attitude. You felt the pains, but you did it. You accepted the reality you couldn't change. You said, and I love to, you can't be sure of life. This is a good theology for life and for our youth. Bravo. Thank you, Peter, for this wonderful comment. Thank you, Richard, for encouraging our brothers. Yeah, and also, yeah. this, this will go out there to encourage all missionaries. Because I know that there are lots of missionaries out there, there are lots of volunteers, there are lots of people out there serving and giving their lives for others. Thank you for all the good works you guys are doing out there. And I would like to use this opportunity once more to say, once again, Happy Mother's Day to all our wonderful mothers out there. You are yeah, our basketball. I'm not sure. I think she's watching. I'm not sure. Okay. <laughs> so, Mom of Pio and all the mothers out there, you are backbones. Thank you for all what you've been doing. And guys, please continue to pray for all the health workers all over the world. We might think it's a joke. I had, I had a friend, a doctor from California, he called me and he was like in pain. He was like, oh, they're like doctors, nurses quitting that job because it is too much. 
Yeah, so guys, true. always remember that there are people out there putting their lives on the line for us. So let us remember them in our prayers. Let us support them the way we can. And no matter what we experience in this life, we should always remember that. Like Pio said, we are with others. People are trying to lend their hands. They want to support us. So let us be willing to accept that support from people. Thank you, Pio, for spending time with us. Thank you for freely sharing your experience with us. And I hope you continue to be a light in the lives of people and of all those you encounter in the hospital, where you go for your apostolate, or in everywhere you, you find yourself tomorrow. Thank you, guys, for sticking with us up to now. Uh, thank and you very much. May you guys find Thanks a lot. And time. Thanks to the viewers also for their... I will say good with messages and um, nice comments. Not a bit try yeah, message. Yeah. 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 So, good luck, guys. You. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So we're going off.